So Daniel chapter 3. I'll, as I said, I'll read the entire chapter, so please give your attention as God's holy word is read. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. 
And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of the fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Well, it should be clear uh, to anyone who observes our culture or watches the news that we are living in an increasingly post-Christian era. If there was ever a time in our past when Christian values were the norm, I think we're kind of well past that time now. And as such that the odds then that Christians will be persecuted for their faith increases. In fact, we already see it in Canada and Europe, not to mention the rest of the non-Christian world where pastors are arrested for either not closing their church down during COVID or saying certain things about certain protected groups in society. And the question I often ask myself is, when the time comes, and it seems like it's coming closer and closer the further we get, right? But when the time comes, Will I have the courage to stand up for my faith or will I fold under the pressure? And that's what we see here in Daniel chapter 3 as we continue our study through the book of Daniel. Um, the series that we're calling Faith Enduring Through Adversity. If you remember our discussion last week on the structure of Daniel, then you know that Daniel 3 is part of the Aramaic portion, Right? Aramaic is the language that Daniel is written in from chapters 2 through 7. The rest of the book is written in Hebrew. So this part of the book we're calling the message to the world. This is what God, through the prophet Daniel, wants to get across to the world in general. And though the people of God here find themselves in the middle of a hostile world, we are called to have a faith that endures through adversity. So as we look at Daniel 3 this morning, the theme here will be God is able and willing to deliver His people. God is able and willing to deliver His people. Well, first, our first point here, we see the king commands in verses 1-7. through seven. And unlike the previous chapters here that we've seen so far, Chapter 3 of Daniel doesn't start with any time marker, right? In the first chapter we saw it was in the third year of King Jehoiakim. Chapter 2 starts in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Here we don't have any time markers to sort of tell us when in history this is happening. Now some will argue that the events here in chapter two, or 3 sort of follow immediately after the events in chapter 2. Others say it could have been as much as 10 or even 20 years later. The point being, of course, that while these events are historical, the goal of the book of Daniel is not to tell the history of Daniel in Babylon. That's not what the book of Daniel is about. It's not to tell how he survived and how his friends survived in Babylon. These events are chosen by God and arranged to deliver several messages to us. The first message Daniel wants to convey is that God is in control. 
We saw that last week. God is in control over the affairs of kings and nations. God is Another message that Daniel wants to get across is that God will judge all kings and nations of the earth. And the final message that Daniel gets across is that God will protect and preserve his people as they live in a hostile world. So though we don't have a time marker, the passage does begin where we see here King Nebuchadnezzar making an image of gold. Now we shouldn't think that King Nebuchadnezzar did this himself, right? I mean, the king doesn't build images. The king tells other people, and they build the images. But King Nebuchadnezzar has this enormous golden image that we see here in verse 1, where the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and it's width six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence, and neither should you think it's a coincidence, that in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of what? Well, he has a dream of a great image, right? Whose head was gold and its chest was silver, its hips and thighs were bronze, and its legs and feet were of iron. So after these events, now king, the king constructs his own great image, which leads me to speculate, I'm speculating here, that these events probably happened very shortly after the events of chapter 2. And again, if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of this great image was of four different metals decreasing in value. Here, the image is what? It's all gold. It's all gold. This is like Nebuchadnezzar's way of saying, look, while, while the dream I had showed a head of gold, which was my kingdom, I'm, I'm defying what God is saying. I'm making an entire image of gold. My empire will never end. My empire will never diminish. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is getting across here. God may give me this dream. I'm going to defy the living God and show you that my empire will, will live forever. I'm going to make this entire image of gold. So King Nebuchadnezzar then has this enormous statue. It's given in cubits, but really if you translate the cubits into English measurements, it's 90 feet by 9 feet wide at the base. And the purpose of this image is for worship. That's why King Nebuchadnezzar builds this. He builds this to promote worship. That's what we see in verses 2 through 7, where here the king calls all of his officials, right? I'm not going to go through the whole, you know, satraps, administrators, judges, so on and so forth. He calls all of these people, all these officials from all over the kingdom to come to the dedication of this great golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has constructed. And the command then goes forth as someone calls forth and says, when you hear all of the music, all of the horns and harps and lyres and psalteries and so on and so forth, when you hear the music, that is your cue to fall down and worship the image. And those who fail to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and notice how in verses 1-7, through seven, we see that phrase repeated, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's repeated six times, very emphasizing the fact that this is something Nebuchadnezzar had done. And every time, and those who failed to worship, they would be cast immediately into a fiery, burning furnace. So then the music plays, and then all the officials do what they're supposed to do. They bow down, and they worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And it's almost kind of... You know, as I said, you know, when we started Daniel, you're going to see uh, how Daniel complements the book of Revelation. If you remember, if you've been with us through our study in Revelation, in Revelation 13, we see these, the, these images, these visions that John has of two beasts. And the first beast, right, is this dreadful looking beast that is representative of all the evil world governments that will come. And the second beast comes up and the second beast's job is to get everybody to worship the first beast. And we see the same thing happening here as Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, creates a golden image and says, everyone must bow down and worship this image. The worship of kings and emperors is nothing new in the history of the world. If you look at the history, if you know anything at all about the history of the world, Kings and emperors have been demanding worship from their people forever. Pharaoh in Egypt, 
the Caesars in Rome, and here uh, Nebuchadnezzar at the head of the Babylonian Empire. And if you don't think that this is happening today, you're not paying attention. They may not be taking an overtly religious overtones, but governments crave power. And they demand that you follow their commands unwaveringly. Very tempted to go into a litany of things that the governments demand us do that we don't want to do, but that's not the point of this message. But the point is, when that happens, and it will happen, right? It's, you, you're not going to escape this. When that happens, what will you do? How will you respond? Well, we learn in verses 8 through 18, as we see Daniel's three friends here, that not all the royal officials bowed down to the statue. They did not worship Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold. Verse 8, Therefore at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Jews are always getting blamed for everything, right? <laughs> Those Jews, they didn't, they're not worshiping your statue, O king. Now the term here, Chaldeans, while it could be speaking of a nationality, is more likely referring to a group of royal officials. Because if you remember... Uh, back in chapter 2, verse 2, we see the Chaldeans are grouped together with the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers who come and try to help Nebuchadnezzar interpret his dream. And again, also, if you remember at the end of chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar found Daniel and his three friends uh, ten times better than the court magicians. So it's, it's not a stretch then to think that these Chaldeans are sort of feeling a certain level of vitriol and animosity toward uh, the, the Jewish men here. In fact, if you have an English, translate, English standard version, it says they maliciously accuse the Jews. So it's not like they're just saying, hey, these guys aren't worshiping. It's like they're actively going out to try to get them in trouble. They maliciously accuse them to the king. Again, remember... God's people here are in a hostile environment. And there's no love lost between the pagan world and the people of God. That's why our faith must endure through adversity. So these Chaldeans, they make a report to the king in verses 9-12. through 12. They remind the king of his order that whoever does not bow and worship the image will be thrown in the fiery furnace, to which the king is like, indeed, yes, that is the command that I gave. And then the Chaldeans say, well... There are certain Jews who have not paid due regard to you, and they do not wor worship or serve your gods, and they do not bow down to the image which you have set up. Now, by certain Jews, they are referring, of course, to Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, you're like, where, where's Daniel in all this, right? <laughs> You know, it's, some have speculated that perhaps Daniel was probably on some mission that the king gave him, or some others speculate that because of Daniel's high position and his favored position, because he was the one who interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that maybe he was exempt from worshiping the image. We don't know, so we shouldn't speculate on this. But whatever the case may be, these three friends are summoned now before the king to call and to give an answer for why they didn't worship. And that's what we see in verses 13 through 15. And here we see the king in rage and fury. Right? So he's told that of all the officials of the government, there are three people who do not bow down to your statue. So he gets angry because tyrants and despots are angry when you refuse to obey them. So they, he calls on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king says, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not bow down to my image. So he gives them one final chance to bow down when they hear the music. All right, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to play the music again, and when you hear the music, you bow down, we'll, we'll call it good. But if not, then that's it. You're going into the fiery furnace. And then he, he adds this at the end of his statement. He says, Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? It's a direct challenge to, to Yahweh, right? He is saying, you know, I know you worship this most high God, but no one is going to be able to deliver you from my 
hands. So he's laid down the gauntlet, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply in verses 16 through 18. I love their response. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, in other words, if, you, if we don't bow down, you're going to throw us into the furnace, then our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Now again, note here their sort of respectful manner, right, in which they, they address the king. O king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you. It's like, you know, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'll give you 10 seconds to respond. It's like, king, we don't need 10 seconds. We don't need one second. We're not going to respond to your statue. It's, it's a sign of resolve. It's not a sign of disrespect. And then they go on to say that if the penalty is a fiery furnace, then so be it. But they do defend God's honor against the king's flippant comment. The king said, no one is going to be able to deliver you from my hand. No God can deliver you from my hand. And they say, no, our God is able to deliver us from your hand. And even if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship your statue. We're still not going to bow down. We're not going to listen to you. And here's the key. They didn't worship God because of what God would do for them. They worshiped God because it was the right thing to do. And that's the kind of response that honors God. Stepping out in faith no matter what may happen. And here they are. They're alone. Of all the officials of the kingdom that bowed down to the statue, they are the, they are the only three who wouldn't. And sometimes your step of faith has to be a lonely one, right? You may be the only one who is not bowing down to whatever is forcing you to bow down. And is that the kind of faith and resolve that we have? Are we prepared to stand in faith alone, even if it means death? Think of all the martyrs in the history of the church who faced a similar choice and made a similar stand. So now... Moving on to verses 19 through 30, we do see that the Most High God does indeed save. And again, King Nebuchadnezzar, being full of fury, he reacts badly <laughs> to Shadrach and Meshach and, and Abednego's faithful stand. He does not take kindly to it in verses 19 through 23. He cannot contain his anger anymore. So he is so angry that they will not bow down to my statue, even after I gave you a second chance. He says, okay, stoke up that furnace seven times hotter. In other words, make it really, really hot. Let's make it really, really hot. And then he commands some mighty men of valor and he says, take these three, bind them and cast them into the furnace. So immediately, so immediate was this, sentence, this, this, this the sentence that they faced that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were still even fully clothed as they were bound and thrown into the furnace. And it was so hot that the mighty men of valor, as they threw them into the furnace themselves, were con consumed by the fire. Which is kind of ironic, right? You know, here we see the men who obey the king, they're the ones consumed by the fire. And the ones who, didn't dis who disobeyed the king, as we will see, are not consumed by the fire. Now, if this were an action movie or some other kind of movie, which I like to watch, if this were an action movie, someone would have swooped in, right? They would have broken in and they would have come at the very last second. The cavalry would have come in and they would have saved the day. Perhaps an angel, if I were writing the story, an angel would have broke in and said, no, you will not cast them into the fiery furnace. 
And they would have vindicated the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, why not? That happened to Abraham, right, on Mount Moriah. As God tells him to sacrifice your son, your only son Isaac, he binds him, puts him on the, on the altar, and is about to drive the knife into his shoulder when an angel says, Abraham, stop! And Abraham, of course, is like, Whew. he stops. So here you would almost expect an angel to say, stop, do not throw them into the fire. Because the heroes of the story are not supposed to be thrown into the fiery furnace, right? That's not how you write stories. So maybe you're thinking, why doesn't God save them from the fiery furnace? I mean, they did everything they were supposed to do. They did all the right things. They stood up for God. They, they, they honored God with their faithful stand. They would not violate the first and second commandments by bowing down to a false image. They did everything they were supposed to do. Why were they still thrown into the furnace? Why didn't God save them before they were thrown into the fiery furnace? And again, I remind you of all the martyrs in the history of the church. Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and 7 and 8 right? Faithful man, full of the Holy Spirit, did wonderful works. And he was stoned. Why didn't God save him from being stoned? Why weren't Peter and Paul saved from the executioner's sword? They did everything they were supposed to do. Paul was stopped on the road to Damascus. He was converted on the spot, and he was told, you will be a witness to me among the Gentiles, and he did so, and he followed everything God told him to do. Why was he still executed? Which again leads me to ask, are we faithful to God because of what he will do for us? Or are we faithful to God because it is the right thing to do, despite the outcome? Well, don't fret. <laughs> Even though they were thrown to the fiery furnace, God is able and willing to deliver his people. That's what we see in verses 24 and 25. So after they're thrown into the fiery furnace and the king's mighty men are consumed by the fire, something alarms or astonishes the king as he sees what's going on in the fire and he asks what others might assume was an obvious question. Did we not cast three men into the fire? And of course the king's attendants, not furthering wanting, wanting to anger him, say, yes, you did indeed throw three men into the fiery furnace. Then he says, why then are there four men in the furnace? And they're loose. And they're walking around. And then he says, for, moreover, the fourth man appeared like the Son of God. Now, if you don't have a New King James Version, you may say, your translation may say, Son of the Gods. And I think that is more appropriate. The, unfortunately, the King, New King James sort of does a little bit of interpretation instead of translation here. Because the Aramaic says, son of the gods. But the point is, having said that, while the king Nebuchadnezzar might think that the fourth man appeared like some divine agent, the point is we know it's more than that. Because most commentators believe, and I agree, that the fourth man in the fire was a pre-incarnate manifestation of the second person of the Trinity. In other words, it was... Jesus, before he became Jesus the man, it was the second person of the Trinity there in the fire with the servants. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't know this, but so what he, he just describes what he sees. Something divine is in there. Whatever it is, it is clearly divine. Now, maybe I'm the only one who thinks this way. I'm thinking to myself, what were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego doing as they were walking around the fire with the fourth man? Right? Were they talking? Were they, I mean, I know what I would be doing if I was in the fire with, with, with a pre-incarnate son of God. I'd be sitting there walking around singing, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. I mean, that's what I would be doing because here I am thrown in the fiery furnace and I've been saved by the Son of God. Now the king is amazed, and he's also humbled. In verses 26 through 30, the king calls out to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and tells them, come out, and they do so. And then the rest of the group, the satraps and the administrators and all the other people, they gather and they see how there was no sign that they had been in the fire. 
No singed hair, no burnt garments, no smell of smoke, nothing. How many people have been by a campfire, right? And you're the one that the fire, the smoke seems to follow wherever you go around the campfire. You can't spend five seconds at a campfire without coming back smelling like smoke. But here, no singed hair, no burnt garments, no smell of smoke, nothing. Verse 27 says, the fire has no power over them. Earlier, Nebuchadnezzar asked arrogantly, who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Well, he now has his answer. The most high God of heaven, that's who will deliver them from your hand. The fire had no power over them. That is complete deliverance. Complete and utter. Now, you know, I mean, if they came out singed and smelling like smoke, you'd be like, that's amazing. But they came out no singed, nothing, as if they hadn't even been close to the fire. That's even more amazing. But it was nothing for God to accomplish. The God who created everything, who created the fire, can also make it so that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are completely preserved in the fire. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar then confesses in verses 28 and 29. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies so that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which, speak, which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So now Nebuchadnezzar honors Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for their stand, their resolve to not worship any gods or images. And so impressed was Nebuchadnezzar that he makes another decree that no one will dishonor or disrespect the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And whoever does will be destroyed. Again, remember, God is able and willing to deliver His people. And He did so here in Daniel 3 in such a way that it was unmistakable who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was the Most High God who shut the mouth of King Nebuchadnezzar. But what about all those who have been martyred for their faith who were not delivered, right? All of those faithful saints who gave their lives worshiping the Most High God and His Son, Jesus Christ, because it was the right thing to do. Well, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say? They said, but if God does not deliver us, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. And that needs to be our attitude and the reason is because we have been saved from far worse than a fiery furnace, right? Jesus Christ, by His life, death, and resurrection, has done far more to deliver us from the wrath and judgment of God so that the flames of all the fiery furnaces in the world don't really matter, right? Right? Who cares? If you have been saved from judgment from God, if you are saved in the arms of Jesus, who cares what the fiery furnaces of the world are going to do? That's what Jesus says in the Gospels, right? Don't fear them who can destroy the body, which is what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar has power to destroy the body. He says, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear him. That's God. The one who can deliver us from the fiery furnaces. So it doesn't matter what the fiery furnaces do as long as we have been saved from the far worse fate of wrath and judgment of God that Jesus Christ bore himself. So again, I began this message by asking, what would, I have, would I have the courage to stand up for my faith? Or would I fold under the pressure? And that's a valid question that we all need to to really think about. And it's valid because our days are not too dissimilar from the days 
of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There may come a time, even in the United States of America, where to take a stand of faith will exact a toll in our lives. At the very least, you might lose some friendships or you might lose some family relationships as you stand up for your faith um, in, your, in your community. You may lose a job or you may lose some job opportunities if you take a stand for your faith. I think of the poor guy, I don't know his name, but the dude who, was, who owned the bakery in Colorado who would not bake the cake for the gay wedding, right? And then he was you know, taken to court and lost his... I mean, he was eventually exonerated from all but he lost everything in the process trying to defend himself. We may even have run afoul of a government and the government authorities, as we see in Canada or other countries. Even in this country, too, right? You know, if you didn't shut down during the, the pandemic, you know, your church, you'd get fined. There were churches in California that would not shut down during the pandemic, and they were fined, and they were eventually themselves exonerated. The point is, do we take a stand with God because of what he will do? Or do we take a stand because it is the right thing to do? That's the decision before us in our day and age. And the good news is not that our faith will never be tested. Or that if we do all the right things, it will be spared the fiery furnace. That's not the good news. right? We saw it here. Daniel, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did all the right things in this situation, yet they still got tossed into the furnace. That's not the good news. The good news is, that our, it's, the good news is not that our faith will never be tested. The good news is that even if we go into the fiery furnace, the Son of God will stand in the fiery furnace with us. That is the good news. And as I think of that, I'm always reminded of Psalm 23, 4, which tells us, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. It's not I will fear no evil because I don't get to go into the valley of the shadow of death. There's never a sign at the valley of the shadow of death that says, do not enter, valley of the shadow of death, ten feet ahead. No, you go in there and you are, you are not frightened because Jesus is there, your good shepherd is there, leading you through the fiery furnace, or leading you through the valley of the shadow of death. I wonder how many of the martyrs of old saw Jesus walking in the fire with them. When Stephen was being stoned, he was able to withstand the pummeling of the stones because he saw Jesus standing at God's right hand. We always talk about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, right? That's the idea that his work is finished. He sits down. His work is finished. But here, Jesus is standing at God's right hand as Stephen is being pummeled with stones. Almost as if he's giving him a, a standing ovation or something. Jesus Christ went through his own fiery furnace, right? He took the wrath of God for us. He said, and he prays in the garden, right? Lord, Father, if this cup could pass from me, but nevertheless, not what I will, what you will. He had to drink the cup of God's wrath. He had to drink the cup of God's wrath. And he went through that fiery furnace of God's wrath on the cross. And then because of that, then we can face our own fiery furnaces in our lives, right? Knowing that God is able and willing to deliver us because he stands with us in those flames. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.